blame women, disproportionately, for the collapse of Western civilization. Originally posted Wednesday, September 30th, 2015. The Greatest Gift Human history has basically been the struggle for freedom. And it has been a struggle against two things. Number one, natural elements or limitations, such as starvation, thirst, disease, famine, cold, heat, predators, etc. And two, other humans. The natural elements that limit human freedom have been fought against, and largely won, with advances in technology, agriculture, economics, and science. We've eliminated starvation and thirst through agricultural technology, cured diseases through medicine, and though we have yet to unlock the secrets of immortality, the majority of people today do not spend their time searching for a clean water source or worrying about where their next meal is coming from. However, whereas natural limitations to human freedom can be solved through vaccines, technology, and other cures found in the physical world, the human-induced limitations to freedom, called tyranny, cannot. By their very nature, they are human, which means eradicating humans would wipe us all out, tyrants and innocents alike, leaving no human history to speak of. Thus, instead of simple solutions such as vaccines, farming methods, economic advances, etc., the solution to human tyranny has been 6,000 years of blood, toil, slavery, war, tears, torture, and other incalculable amounts of human suffering. However, slowly but surely, humankind has made advances in pushing back the tyranny that once enslaved us all. First, it was fighting against the warlords and tribal chieftains who merely enslaved entire tribes for their own enrichment and pleasure. Then it was against religious theocracies who, again, merely used deities in the threat of hell, or burning at the stake, to enslave entire populations for their own advancement. Monarchs and kings were nothing more than glorified warlords who were benevolent enough to let their peasants participate in the euphemism of slavery called serfdom. And even today, after billions of gallons of human blood has been spilled, we have outright dictators and despots who, again, use their people as cattle to live high off of. But still, after all of this, some humans have managed great advances against tyranny. And after many wars, reformations, revolutions, magna cartas, and constitutions, a genuinely free society in the form of Western civilization formed, arguably with the United States of America as its most refined product. For the first time in history, humans can do what they want, say what they want, believe what they want, but above all else, be entitled to the vast majority of the fruits of their labor. They are no longer slaves to a tyrant, slaves to a theocracy, or serfs to a king. They are their own masters and they govern themselves. And it is this, that man has freed himself from not just nature but other men, that is the pinnacle achievement of humankind. This freedom, which has cost more than anything else in terms of human blood, time, toil, suffering, and sacrifice, is the greatest gift humans have ever given themselves. In letting people keep the majority of the proceeds of their time and letting them have agency over their own lives, humans have made the most incredible of advances over the past 300 years, which is roughly when freedom started to become prevalent in Western civilization. We have solved hunger. We discovered automation. We discovered electricity, we achieved flight, we've eradicated disease, founded computing, unlocked chemistry, and a million things more, all of which have allowed us to create lives for ourselves that are so amazing and rapidly advancing that they were incomprehensible to merely a single generation before. It is the proverbial finger free men can give the past 6,000 years of tyrants. But all of this, all of it, hinges on one thing that people are allowed to remain free and be entitled to the vast majority of their own production and be the masters of their own lives. And if we lose that, we lose everything. Enter women. Women. Women, in a historical context, of course, have always been here. They are a part of human history as much as any man. However, they are not the primary actors, participants, or determiners of human history, largely because of biology and nature's natural tyrants. Women are physically weaker, thus less prone to wage war and participate in battle. They also are the ones to get pregnant, again physically limiting what they can do in a world largely ruled by might makes right. They are also more nurturing, psychologically predisposing them to stay at home and rear the children. And they also have boobs, 
which, if you didn't know, was nature's kind of authoritative way of saying, yeah, you're the one who's going to stay off the battlefield and rear the children. This is not to belittle or besmirch the role of women in history, of which there are many examples. It is, however, to point out that the vast majority of human history has been determined and made by men. Consequently, this greatest gift of freedom that was so hotly contested for over these past 6,000 years was bought and paid for by the deaths, blood, toil, and suffering of hundreds of millions, if not billions, of men. Additionally, it is men who have availed themselves of this freedom well beyond that of women. The vast majority of all scientific advances have, once again, been discovered through the mental sweat and toil of men. And while we can all certainly rush to point out the occasional female scientist or inventor, this fact is blatantly apparent, even today, where the majority of STEM students are men and the majority of social work majors are women. The point, however, is not a competition as to who created what and what the sex ratio of corpses were on history's battlefields. The point is, this freedom and the commensurate amazing technology and incomprehensibly easy life that came with it was available to both sexes, even though men largely earned it. And with these amazing advances in technology, life got so easy, in historical terms, that humans no longer had to worry about the natural tyrants that historically oppressed them – disease, starvation, sanitation, etc. – but could now focus their efforts on much lesser problems. What were these problems? Well, more of the sociological variety. Egalitarianism, education, health, family, crime, psychology, etc. However, a very interesting one was the issue of women's suffrage and equality. Previous to this, and admittedly by nature, women were just plain not allowed into the management and leadership of society. Men had paid the price, literally in blood, sweat, and toil, and it was laughable at the time that women would have a say in economic and political affairs. However, with technology, invented by men, afforded to them by the freedom they paid a dear price for, pressing matters such as war, famine, disease, etc. were becoming less and less frequent. Additionally, labor-saving devices created by the Industrial Revolution <clears throat> men, allowed women not to be anchored at home, as well as allowed them to work, earning a keep just like men. Furthermore, it wasn't as if raising children and maintaining a home was not work itself. Ergo, there was a good and compelling argument to consider letting women have the vote. And so, in 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified in the United States, and women were allowed to vote. However, whatever the logical, economic, philosophical, not to mention moral reasons there were to let women vote, you cannot deny that there would be huge consequences in literally doubling the voting population to include a group of humans who are biologically, psychologically, mentally, and emotionally different from men. And the primary fear that would result from such a dramatic shift in voting rights is that the world's greatest gift humanity gave to itself, freedom, would be undone. Women would vote for more state intervention, reinstating the human tyrants, essentially undoing what hundreds of millions of men had fought for over the past 6,000 years. Of course, on the face of it, this is laughable. No doubt such concerns were scoffed at during the early days of women's suffrage, just as they would be today. Why would women consciously vote themselves and the rest of humanity back into tyranny? Who wants to be ruled by a dictator? Who wants to slave away for the government? However, if we are to look at the empirical data and see how women have handled the responsibility of voting, we see that is precisely what they're doing. And there is, sadly, no debate about it. Again, the vast majority of human history has been a struggle for freedom from its oppressors. It has been minimizing the government that lords over them and maximizing the individual. It has been allowing people to keep the majority of the fruits of their own labor and control over their destiny. And the way you can tell whether somebody in Western civilization is for freedom or not is quite simply this. Do they vote for more government, or do they vote for less? This further simplifies into the direct actions of, do they vote left, or do they vote right? Do they vote labor, or do they vote conservative? Do they vote Democrat, or do they vote Republican? And while admittedly there are certainly flaws with all political parties, this is the voting action that belies the intention of the individual, and women's intention has been for more government, a larger state, and less freedom. Unfortunately, 
The data is not perfect, as it only goes back to the Eisenhower administration, and please provide me better data if you have it, but it will suffice. The best data I could find on voting patterns for women is the presidential Gallup poll that measures the lead, plus, or deficit, minus, Democrat candidates had among men and women. This graph takes a bit of thinking to understand, but for the sake of simplicity, it's best to read it as, if there's a positive sign, men slash women like the Democrat plus X, or, if there's a negative sign, men slash women hate Democrats minus X. But regardless of the complexity and shortcomings of the chart, the point is very clear. Women prefer a larger state and less freedom than men. However, within this chart, there are two other important observations. One, you have to read the numbers, not just look at the right column. Originally, women actually preferred the Republican candidates over men, especially during the Eisenhower administrations. They even preferred the ugly Richard Nixon over the hot and handsome John F. Kennedy in 1960, though not by a very wide margin. It wasn't until 1972, and especially 1976, that women switched to preferring a larger state. Two, this switch accelerated rapidly from 1976 to 2012, going from just an 11-point preference over men for a larger state to a full 20-point preference with Obama's second election. This doesn't make a lot of sense if women were supposed to be the four horsemen of the apocalypse for Western civilization. Then why did they wait a full 50 years to start voting in a larger state? The answer may be found in a study conducted by Dr. John Lott and Dr. Lawrence Kennedy. Quote, There is strong evidence that it takes a very long time for turnout to fully respond to major changes in the voting franchise. Between 40 and 54 years are needed after women are granted the voting franchise for their turnout to match men's turnout. Just because women were granted the right to vote didn't mean that they all went to the polls that day in 1920. A lot stayed home. A lot voted the way their husbands told them. Some of them still didn't find it their place or their right to vote. It takes about a generation or so for different groups of people to fully avail themselves of the franchise. This makes a lot of sense in that if you add roughly 50 years to 1920, you get 1970, where women voted in force and showed their true pro-government colors. But while this may explain the increase from Gertrude voting in 1924 to Janis Joplin voting in 1972, it doesn't explain the increasingly passionate love affair, nay, stalker-like obsession women have had with the government from 1972 to today. Why are women increasingly fanatic about having a larger government? Well, the answer can also be found in the dates. 1972. Feminism. While the Susan B. Anthonys of the 1890s wanted the right to vote, own property, and sign legal contracts, the radical feminists of the 1970s were nothing but outright Marxists who cowardly hid behind their genitalia, claiming it caused sexism and thus entitled them to a lifelong government check. While for the most part they could be written off as such, unfortunately they largely got into a key position in society that would further influence future generations of women to come the only place that would take them, academia. And it was from our colleges, universities, and other educational institutions that feminists have very successfully convinced two full generations of young girls, Gen X and millennials, to vote against freedom and for an increasing state. Now I could go on measuring the various ways women vote for tyranny over freedom, but the point is that for whatever reason, they do. And worse, increasingly so. They vote for the government at the expense of the individual. They vote for dependence rather than independence. They vote for a government check before a paycheck. And while we could sit here and debate about whether that's the price we have to pay for equality or that maybe men were wrong this entire time and that maybe it's time for a different approach, they are doing precisely what we feared. They are undoing what all of human history fought for these past and painful 6,000 years. They are undermining freedom. They are destroying Western civilization. The question is whether we as a people, both male and female, love the freedoms afforded to us by the countless sacrifices of countless generations before us enough to have the courage to merely state this fact. The Costs of Naivete 
But while women, as a group, tend to vote for tyranny, the question is whether they do this consciously, whether they do it maliciously. Do women wake up every morning licking their chops saying, I can't wait to bring down Western civilization today? Or are they just naive, blissfully believing the sweet lies politicians tell them about free education, free health care, free child care, free food, free housing, and free everything? The answer is rather clear. Very few people are genuinely evil and wish bad things upon others. And we can safely say that the majority of women are not evil people who wish to destroy the best development of human history. And though there are some genuinely evil people who do wish to destroy and harm others, feminists and social justice warriors, the vast majority of women are well-intentioned, caring people. The problem, however, is that you can be the sweetest woman with all the best intentions in the world. If you're naive or ignorant to the point that you're wrong, you'll still have the same effects as being an evil, malicious person out to cause damage. Thus, whether out of ignorance or evil, society is going to pay the exact same price, no matter your intentions. And so, as women vote and make other decisions in life about how the country should be run, Western civilization suffers because of their ignorance and naivete. The first and most obvious of these is money. Money is not the root of all evil, or some kind of tool of control for evil capitalists. It is your time. It is your life. It is what you get in exchange for forfeiting a fraction of your finite life in the form of labor. You then use this root of all evil as a means to support yourself and keep yourself alive. The freedom of speech is one thing. The freedom of religion is another. But the freedom to be entitled to the majority of the money you make is the most important freedom, as it is your life. But women think nothing of voting in tyrants who want to take it. Readers of my blog are already intricately aware of the amount of money governments take from their citizens every year. They are aware of government spending to GDP. They are aware of government debt to GDP. They are aware of 70% of the state's budget going to income redistribution. They are aware of the difference between a million and a trillion. Your average Western civilization female voter is not. Your average female voter is a byproduct of her evolution, environment, genetics, and upbringing. And therefore, your average female voter is stuck in stage one, thinking where she, one, wants to solve a problem, but two, doesn't know how much it will cost, but three, doesn't care because she never looked at the budget anyway, because four, she thinks the government has unlimited money, because five, she really doesn't know the difference between a million and a trillion. So, six votes for more government spending anyway. The problem is, she literally does not realize that money just doesn't come from poof out of nowhere, and she certainly doesn't understand how the government just printing off more money would result in hyperinflation. Thus, in a very naive and childlike way, she will do what is logical to a seven-year-old. Vote for more government money. Consequently, voting the country that inch further into tyranny and enslaving us all that microsecond more in taxes. Now you multiply this times 150 million women over the course of now four generations, and you get what we're all familiar with. Debt to GDP of 110%. Government spending as a percent of GDP at 40%. Slowing economic growth, etc. But the larger point is that the relationship between women and voting and government is not merely one of more socialists being elected, but increased government spending which directly lessens the amount of money and time we have to ourselves. Unfortunately, the cost of female naivete does not stop at a simple increase in our tax bill. The consequences cascade horribly from there. For in voting for an ever-increasing government, you, by default, crowd out the people it governs. And with government accounting for now 40% of GDP, something's gotta give. The first thing that gave was men, specifically in their role as fathers, husbands, and the heads of households. Previous to women's suffrage and the massive expansion of government, men were the nucleus of society and the economy. It was around a man families and societies were raised and it was his economic production that supported them all. However, as women voted in more and more social spending, they effectively replaced men with the government. 
It was no longer the man who brought home the bacon, but the mailman who delivered the government check. It was no longer Dad who would feed the kids, but the EBT card afforded to you by Barack Obama. And it was no longer Father who paid the mortgage and kept a roof over the family's head, but HUD in their Section 8 housing. Soon, women started asking the question 1970s feminists were dying them to ask all along. Why do we need a man? And sure enough, 73% of black women, 51% of Latinas, and 28% of white women agreed. Why did they need a man? And those respective percentages of women went forth and had illegitimate children thinking a government check was a superior substitute to a father. Sure enough, without purpose or agency in life, and their birthright as a man taken from them by a government check, more and more men lost all hope and started checking out of society. They started marrying less, working less, substituted real women with porn, and lived vicariously through video games. They were no longer the strong and intrepid men like their World War II ancestors, but unincentivized, lifeless men with no direction or purpose. And with the economic nucleus of Western civilization disheartened to the point of inaction, economic growth started to slow. With the engine of Western civilization sidelined from their original roles of fathers and husbands, the next ship to fall was, naturally, the family. Without a father around, the American family started to disintegrate. There were, of course, pre-ruined families called single-parent homes, denying children from birth the right to a stable nuclear family. But even those children lucky enough to have been born to a husband and wife only stood a 50-50 shot of having a normal childhood as half of all marriages ended in divorce. The wife wasn't happy, and she needed to find herself. And the feminists were there, egging them on every inch of the way. Sure enough, more than half of all children born from the 1970s on would be brought up in non-stable, non-nuclear families. And while this may have been championed by feminists and other true enemies of Western civilization, it took a devastating toll on those children who were the future generations of America. Depression, suicide, crime, debt, divorce, alcoholism, nearly every single social and psychological ailment you can think of is positively correlated with having no stable nuclear family to be brought up in. Alas, not only did half of America's future endure this, it left such a bad taste in their mouths that the smart ones said, never again, swearing never to have children, tanking the birth rate and putting an end to American families. This relates closely to the third domino to fall, lost sovereignty. Since leftist politicians, as well as rightists, want to stay in power, they will do whatever they can to ensure they are in control of the government. This not only means bribing the naive portion of the population with free everything, but it also means sacrificing the nation itself. As long as these tyrants don't have to work real jobs, they will do whatever they can to stay in power. Enter immigration. I find three things cute, endearing, and ironically tragic. Number one, the refugee crisis going on in Europe. Number two, the illegal immigration debate in the U.S. And number three, the rape epidemic in Sweden. In all three cases, men and women, rightists and leftists alike, are against, if not aghast, at what is happening in their respective countries when it comes to immigration. And, well, that whole rape thing. In Europe, nearly everybody is against the allowance of 2 million refugees, but their governments still allow it to happen. In the U.S., 76% of Democrats are against illegal aliens' amnesty, but again, our government allows it to happen. And in Sweden, ah, lovely socialist, very pro-feminist Sweden. There's a bit of a rape epidemic going on due to the immigrant Muslim population there. But nobody dares grow the balls to kick them out in fear of being accused of racism. Now, in all three cases, the women, I presume, and especially in Sweden, are against those immigrants coming into their respective countries. However, even with broad support from people across the political spectrum, the governments, leftist ones, mind you, ignore the desires of their people and let these immigrants in, knowing full well they will never return to their countries of origin. Why? Because it will keep the left in power. 
It will expand and ensure future government control. Those are all future leftist voters who will demand future leftist politicians. Alas, this is the perfect example of how women's naivete deals another blow to Western civilization. Even though women are generally against illegal immigration, and I would also presume rape, they never get past the stage one thinking of, well, the Democrats slash labor slash left is for the children slash the little guy slash the poor slash the old slash the fluffy bunnies, so I'm going to vote for them. But then are surprised when leftists like Tony Blair or Jack Kennedy sell the sovereignty of their nation to foreigners who plain don't care to adhere to Western civilization, if not outright hate it, so they can ensure they and their party remain in control of the government. Again, it doesn't matter what women's intentions or expectations are when they vote. If they vote for the wrong people, the effects will be the same as if a malicious and evil person intent on destroying the country voted and allowing people from a culture that is non, if not anti, Western civilization is arguably the final blow to the long-term survival of Western civilization. The solution. To be frank, there is none. This entire post is merely one for posterity, wherein I will be able to say I told you so for the rest of my life, as well as an exercise in philosophical and theoretical thought. The left is too heavily funded, well too positioned in education, media, government, and the universities, and have done such a great job of brainwashing women that there will never be a significant percentage of women that will wake up and heed the points I've made above. Additionally, in a comedic but still 100% truthful sense, in the wise words of Bill Burr, Women are surrounded by this tornado of misinformation about how great they are, and nobody corrects them because we want to fuck them. However, if we are serious about not throwing away the best gift humanity has ever given itself, and we do not wish to dishonor the untold number of men who paid incalculable prices over the past 6,000 years, we need to look at who has the right to vote. The obvious solution is to rescind women's suffrage. The various leftist political parties in Western nations would never recoup from such a loss, and we could very easily enact or rescind the legislation necessary to put Western civilization back on the fast track. However, this is not the answer. If we rescind women's right to vote, then why not blacks? If not blacks, why not Jews? If not Jews, then why not dashingly handsome half-Irish economists with a penchant for video games and motorcycle riding? That road merely goes back to the tyranny we're wishing to stave off. The answer lies in the founding principle of Western civilization. Merit. Admittedly, I've been very hard on women in this treatise, but rightly so. However, while the majority of women do vote against freedom, we all know women personally who are not naive, who do not vote with their hearts, and who are not stuck at stage one thinking, and actually do know the difference between a million and a trillion. We know women who desperately love their husbands, desperately love their children, and take the time to study the finances, economics, and politics of this nation before ditzily casting off their vote for the politician who promises them the most money. Concurrently, we also know blacks, Hispanics, Asians, Jews, Madagascarians, gays, Eskimos, Indians, Muslims, agnostics, Catholics, and lesbians who also earn their keep, study the country's finances, and also desire to vote for freedom and against the state. Ergo, we cannot rely on mere physical traits or religious beliefs, but rather whether they are contributing members of society who have earned the right to vote, not merely spat out of a vagina within the U.S.'s borders. And there are ways to do that, some of which have already been done. For example, in the embryonic years of the United States, you not only had to be a white male to vote, you also had to own property. The Founding Fathers had this requirement because not only did they not want blacks or women to vote, but because they also didn't want stupid white men to vote. You couldn't just have been born a white male, you also had to prove that you could work and manage your finances accordingly so that you were a productive member of society. And requiring ownership of property was a proxy for that hurdle. However, while that may have had the intended effect in 1790, Today, we have the technology such that a much better and much more meritorious voting franchise can be given. Taxes. Very simply, if you want to vote, you need to have paid taxes. If you collect a government check, no. 
If you're on EBT, no. Are you on TANF? No. Disability? No. Social Security? No. Housing assistance? No. Attending a state university and getting a subsidy from the taxpayer? No. You must be a contributing member of this society, paying into the government to have a say in how the country is run. You must not be a parasite collecting a government check, making you by definition a ward of the state. This discriminates against no one, but ensures that those who are paying for the government are the ones determining how it is managed, and is thus far, in my economist mode of thinking, the best way to award the right to vote. Of course, sadly, as I said before, this is all academic. Too many people who are too vested in the demise of Western civilization already have the vote. And too many people, both men and women, are just plain too damn stupid, ignorant, and naive to listen to reason, evidence, logic, and reality. But let it be said and noted that when Western civilization finally collapses, when Rome version 2.0 falls, when humanity's greatest gift to itself is taken away, it was the female voter and her naivete that was disproportionately to blame. And those 6,000 years of human pain, suffering, sacrifice, blood, and war was undone by 60 years of childish, spoiled, petulant feminism.